The adult Sunday school les lesson this morning and the discussion that was had there, it was an uh, absolute beautiful entry into what I'm going to do today. Uh, for those of you who were here Wednesday night, was that a bit tedious? I just You don't have to answer me. I just want you to think about it. Did you find that boring or tedious? I know that that subject probably left you with as many questions as you got answers. I'm just here to tell you the answers are out there if you wish to get them. The number one job of an elder, and I take this very seriously, is no different than what Jesus said to Peter. Feed the flock. That is the number one rule given to elders. You can read this in Acts 20. Feed the flock. That is the responsibility. That does not make us perfect people. But it lays on us the charge to know the food, right? Be prepared to give an answer. And that really is the job for all of us, right? Be ready always to give an answer to everyone who would ask you why you believe what you believe. That's our number one job, preparation for that. It isn't always easy. I'm pretty sure a lot of us didn't like memorizing multiplication tables. But it's hard to proceed in math without that. And as we talked about this morning, some of the deep things of the scriptures are not about conversion, but they're about bolstering faith. Also, the number one job of someone who gets up front or teaches in any way is to provide shortcuts. For the students, that we find a method by which we can help them leapfrog over the difficult parts of learning something. Hopefully we develop a method that we can help them to see something. But a lot of it still requires your eyes going over the material. That said, a consuming fire. How many of you know what the four words that come before that are? For our God is a consuming fire. How many of you that were here Wednesday night, and if you weren't here Wednesday night, I have the notes. If you're curious, I'll tell you what references we went over. How many of you noticed Wednesday night how much fire was mentioned in that text in Ezekiel. In fact, right out of the box, it says he saw a vision of a whirlwind with raging fire. Okay? Now there was noise, thunder, lightning, and an earthquake quite often mixed with this. I'm going to ask you today to kind of keep track of the different things that I'm going to point out in these texts. This is a multifaceted lesson. There's several things that I'm trying to do here. Several weeks ago, I made some comments about the text in Romans 12, verse 20. To heap coals of fire on someone's head, what that means. And I made some statements, and today I intend to back those statements up with information that we can get from the Scriptures. But that's only part of it. That's only part of what this is. Okay. Genesis 12.3. Also, I want you to note something. Look at the clock. Everybody look at the clock. How many minutes do we have left? One episode on Netflix is how long? Come on, I know you know. <laughs> About 43 to 47 minutes, depending on what it is, right? Okay. 
Let's average it at 45. Once a week, we ask you to think about this as seriously as you think about an episode on Netflix, at least. It's not a tall ask. It really isn't. And I know that we talk about some things, I do sometimes, that, that maybe are deeper than just simply love, Christian living, how we treat our neighbor. Okay? We need to move beyond those things. That's what the author of Hebrews says. Move beyond. That's what it means to grow up, to be mature in the knowledge of the truth. Okay. Genesis 12, 3. This isn't very deep, is it? For us here, I hope our learning is such that most of the kids know this. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. A study in cause and effect. And I want you to be noting the causes and the effects. Affect is a verb. Effect is a noun. Note the causes and the effects as we go through this. Fortunately, the discussion we had this morning saved what I was going to do next. I was going to ask you some questions, but those really were asked this morning in an adult lesson. So just think about that. Remember that what we looked at Wednesday night, that flaming fire and that vision of God, the first words out of his mouth to Ezekiel after he said, stand up, were, I'm sending you to Israel a rebellious nation. Don't you be rebellious like they are. And then he gets this little scroll of a book, right? He's told to eat it. But it said inside of it were, remember those? I wrote it down so I wouldn't forget. Lamentation, mourning, not as in the sun coming up, but as in grieving and woe. So that should give you a clue as to what was going to happen next with this vision that he saw of God coming in a whirlwind of raging fire. And if you know what happened to the nation of Israel, to the city of Jerusalem in 587 B.C., then you know why that message was that way. Moving on. I read this Wednesday night. I'm going to read it again because it's my experience that you have to hear something three times before you start to get it. Okay? Here's number two for you this week. Psalm 18, 6 through 14. In my distress, cause and effect, watch for it, I called upon the Lord, and there's various levels of cause and effect, David was distressed, so he called on the Lord. There's a call and effect. Now there's going to be another call and effect. I called upon the Lord and cried out to my God, cause, he heard my voice, effect, but it's deeper than that. He heard my voice from his temple, my cry came before him, even to his ears. Then God reacted. To David calling to him. He said, Then the earth shook and trembled. The foundations of the hills also quaked and were shaken because he was angry. Cause. The word because in English is pointing out cause and effect. Because he was angry, smoke, and I want you to note these different words are in red here, smoke went up from his nostrils, and devouring fire from his mouth, coals were kindled by it. He bowed the heavens also and came down with darkness under his feet. He rode upon a cherub or carob and flew. He flew upon the wings of the wind. He made darkness his secret place. His canopy around him was dark waters and thick clouds out of the skies. Now this is all David saying, this is as a result, this is the effect, 
that came from the cause of him being distressed and crying out to God. It said, from the brightness before him, his thick clouds passed with hailstones and coals of fire. The Lord thundered from heaven, and the Most High uttered his voice, hailstones and coals of fire. He sent out his arrows and scattered the foe, lightnings in abundance. He vanquished them. Psalm 140, starting at verse 8. Do not grant, O Lord, the desires of the wicked. Don't give wicked people what, want, what they want. This is a request. Okay? Do not further his wicked scheme, lest they be exalted. Selah. Just side note, the word Selah, it just means this time of reprieve. It's like the guitar solo in Psalm, all right? Quit singing. Moment where the instruments could play. As for the head of those who surrounded me, let the evil of their lips cover them. Let burning coals fall upon them. Let them be cast into the fire, into deep pits that they rise not up again. Let not a slanderer be established in the earth. Let evil hunt the violent man to overthrow him. I know that the Lord will maintain the cause of the afflicted and justice for the poor. Several things need to be noted, commented about in this text. The author of this is calling for God to take punitive action. Okay? And I emphasized punitive action. But I'm going to back up and say that again and emphasize something else. The author is calling for God to make punitive action. Not him or her, whatever the case may be. But calling for God to do it in the only just fashion, that which God can only produce. A just punitive action. And the acknowledging that this person knows that the Lord will maintain the cause of the afflicted and provide justice for the poor. But it's God that does it. Habakkuk, a little book we don't read from very much, contemporary to Ezekiel and Jeremiah, about 597 B.C. If you know what's going on, Babylon, the Chaldeans, are going to come down and destroy that city of Jerusalem. The ten tribes are already gone. The city of Jerusalem is predicted to burn. And I just quote part of verse 3, God came from Teman. In that, in that little prophecy, it's about the countries that surrounded, the nations that surrounded Israel, okay? And the curse on them. I'll bless those that bless you and curse him that curses you. And those nations cursed Israel. And so this prophecy is about what's going to come on them. Verse 4, his brightness was like the light. He had rays, and this is talking about God. He had rays flashing from his hand, and there, was, and there his power was hidden. Before him went pestilence and fever. More on that in a minute. Followed at his feet. He stood and measured the earth. He looked and startled the nations. And the everlasting mountains were scattered. The perpetual hills bowed or bowed. His ways are everlasting. And where the asterisk is there next to fever, the King James, the old original one, says burning coals. Young's literal translation says burning fire. 
ASV says fiery bowls. And you might have other translations that may say something different. But I hope we get the point there. That's what goes before God, just like the prophet Ezekiel saw that we looked at Wednesday night. Why is there any importance? He measured the earth. Well, we're going to look at some texts in the book of Revelation, and I mentioned them Wednesday night in Hebrew, or excuse me, in Revelation 11. John is told, here's a rod, here's a reed, use it as a measuring rod, and measure the temple, the altar, and those that worship there. Now you think about that. Is he measuring the height of the person, the breadth of the person, how many there were? But what's interesting in that text is it never says anything about the result of the measuring. He's just told to do it. It doesn't tell you what conclusions are come to. It doesn't tell you any dimensions or numbers. So we have to ask ourselves, what does he mean by measure? And here it says that God stood and measured the earth. You ever use the phrase, well, that doesn't measure up. What do we mean by that? It really means to take notice. Make a mental note about something. Look at it. Note that this is integral to what we're going to talk about. And I think that's how we have to understand it in Revelation 11. It's so interesting to me how much John borrows from the prophets of the Old Testament. And Ezekiel was told to measure. The difference was, and we looked at that Wednesday night, chapters 40, through 40 last numbers in the 40s are all about measuring the temple and defining it. But there he actually gives numbers. Revelation 11, not so. But it said that God measured the earth and found that it didn't measure up, apparently, because what he hands out is pestilence and fiery stuff. Right? Right? Let's see if we can't understand a little bit about the, the symbolism of some of this. Because you have the, the very literal fire of judgment, right? Revelation 18 tells us the city of Rome is going to literally burn. Been lots of fire involved history with the, the many wars that have happened, right? But let's look at some things symbolically here. Once a year, in fact, we're just about there. I don't know if we're the day or not. The Yom Kippur, do we know what that is? Day of Atonement. The one day when the high priest would enter the holiest of holies and there was a bullock that was sacrificed and the blood would go in and he'd first offer for himself and then for the people and read about this in Hebrews as well as in Leviticus. But another thing happened that first time. The scapegoat. And this is, this, this is the accounting of that. I'm just going to read part of it. Verse 9 of Leviticus 16. And Aaron shall bring the goat on which the Lord's lot fell and offer it as a sin offering. Now, there's a couple things we have to think about here. There's a Passover lamb, and then there's scapegoats. Jesus is called our Passover in 1 Corinthians 5, the Lord our Passover. He's not called a goat. Jesus said something about goats. He did. Remember he mentioned sheep and goats. The goats, goats were the naughty ones, and anybody that's ever had goats knows that goats can be naughty ones. They're not headed, and they are trouble. They'll gird every tree that they can get around if they're little trees. Here there's two goats, but one of them gets off, gets to be set free. The other one is offered as a sin offering. 
But the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to make atonement upon it and to let it go as the scapegoat into the wilderness. I believe this is, a, is symbolic of God's grace, how it works. Both were goats. One got to live. The other did not. Remember in Hebrews it says, without the shedding of blood there is no remission of sins. So it's in that context that we're going to read the next verses. Then he shall take a censer, it's like a bowl or a, some kind of vessel, a bowl or a pan, could be clay, could be brass, could be gold. Say that because in Revelation, we're talking about a golden censer. He shall take a censer, this is Aaron still, full of burning coals of fire from the altar before the Lord. With his hands full of sweet incense. So he's got the incense, says beaten fine, and bring it inside the veil. So he's got his hands full of this, but he's also got a censer with him full of fire from off the altar. Okay? So he takes the incense. Let's read verse 13. He shall put the incense on the fire. So he takes the stuff in his hand puts it into the censer where the fire is, before the Lord, that the cloud of incense may cover the mercy seat that is on the testimony, lest he die. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. The vengeance of God will come on all unless there's mercy, unless there's grace. Why? Is there an altar to burn the animals that are sacrificed? What does it symbolize? The burning up, the consuming up. Think about that. Revelation 8, verse 2 through 6. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. Okay. This kind of requires that you either go back and learn or that you already know a little bit about the book of Revelation and what the trumpets are. This is not a fanfare. Okay? This is not a symphony. These trumpets are call to war. That God is angry with the nations. If you know what happens in chapters Six, seven, it leads up to this. Six is the six seals in which it says, it says things went from good to bad in the church age, and then there were people dead under the altar that say, when are you going to avenge us? Dead bodies under the altar that cry out, when are you going to avenge us? on those who inhabit the earth. Okay? Clearly a call for vengeance, but a call to God. The saints aren't doing it. His answer in the rest of the seals is, I've got this. Before this is done, everybody small and great are going to be calling on the mountains to fall on them because they're afraid of the wrath of God and the Lamb. That's takes you to the end of the sixth chapter. The seventh chapter is, I saw 144,000 people that were from the different tribes of Israel, and I saw an innumerable number of people from all nations, tongues, and they're all praising God, and he says, mark them, seal them. And if you were here Wednesday night, you, were, you heard how Ezekiel was told, Tell the guys who have charge over the city, get their swords out. And another one was told, you go mark everybody who's bothered by the bad behavior. Don't touch them. And then he was told, 
now you start the people with the swords. You start in the middle of the temple at the sanctuary and you go out from there and you don't pity anyone. You kill them. Don't touch the ones who are marked. We find the same thing in chapter 7. Now we're in chapter 8. They've all been counted. They've all been marked. Now he says the seven angels are about to sound. Now we're at verse 3. Then another angel having a golden censer came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hand. And the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and threw it to the earth. coals of fire from the altar where the sacrifice was, where we read in the sixth chapter, or I didn't, I referred to it. You can read it yourself. The souls of those that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God were at that altar and they're calling out, when are you going to avenge us? So the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and threw it on the earth. And there were noises, thunders, lightnings, and earthquakes. Sound familiar? Psalm 18, Psalm 140, Habakkuk 3. The same kind of language. So the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. It's time for the punishment to commence. We have to understand this is all happening in the church age. It's my belief most of this is already in our past. So we have to look at history and say, when did God cause pestilence? When did he cause famine? When did he cause many ice ages? When did he cause darkness and change in temperature? For those that are in the history class, this should ring pretty, pretty true, right? Why did they call them the Dark Ages? And it was more than just that they didn't have information. It was partly that. But literally, the, word, the world went through some pretty tumultuous times, some pretty heavy with plague, pestilence, and things going on that were not easy to live through. James 5, 16 through 17. Confess your trespasses one to another, and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective and fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And there's a ton in here that we could talk about, working it backwards. You look through the scriptures and the prophecies and see how many times you're going to see three and a half pop up. If you want something interesting to, to tease your brain. Cause and effect. He prayed, rain stopped. Do we believe for a moment that Elijah did it? I hope not. God did it. But he did it at the request of and at the words of Elijah. Down at the bottom of the screen I have 1 Kings 18, 21 through 39. Do you know what happened there? Yeah, the prophets of Baal. Did Elijah pray for something to come down from heaven? Fire. What happened in 2 Kings? The very first story in 2 Kings chapter 1 is 
the king sends some men, like he sends a guy with 50 other guys with him. So he sends 51 guys to Elijah and says, you need to come with us and go talk to the king. And Elijah says, if I'm a man of God, then let fire come down from heaven and devour you. So the king sends 51 more. A man over the 50 and 50. Same thing. He does it a third time. But the third guy that's the head over 50 is smart enough to approach easy and say, uh, we're your servants. We're just the messengers. Please let us live. And they get to live. The point being, people called fire down from heaven. Okay? Just keep that, keep track of that. Joel 2, 29 through 31. And also on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. Now, you can read this in Acts 2. Because when Peter does his famous sermon on the day of Pentecost, here's where he starts. Remember, they thought these guys were drunk. And he says, no, these people aren't drunk. It's just the, it's the third hour of the morning. They're not drunk. But this is that which was prophesied by the prophet Joel. And he quotes this text. But we're reading it from Joel. Why do I tell you that? Because obviously, Peter said... That was going to happen after the moment that he's talk, standing there talking. He says, this is going to start now. This isn't something in the past. This was going to start where Peter was talking. And it's going to go forward, and yet we have a bracket at the other end of it as well. For you to be this side. There's a bracket at this end of, the, of these verses too. We'll get there. And also on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. I think we can just encapsulate this as there's going to be wars. Because that's how God works in punitive action against the people of the earth. Wars. He sends pestilence. He sends plagues. But when that doesn't work, war. And you see that that is the example all the way through with Israel. When they wouldn't listen, here came the, here came the Assyrians, here comes Egypt, here comes the Babylonians, here comes Persians, here comes the Greeks, here comes the Romans. Okay? And later, through the church age, those people known as the Holy Roman Empire, who opposed those people. Blood, fire, pillars of smoke, the results of war. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. Really, the easiest way to understand that is their days are going to be dark and their nights bloody. Okay? That God's going to bring conditions to them where they're going to go, oh man. These are dark times. These are bloody times. But it happens before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. So this is all happening between the time when Peter was standing there preaching and before Jesus comes back. The times where we're living. These things were going to happen. So we look at those things that come on the earth for an understanding of this. Revelation 6, 9, 10, and then 13, 10. When he opened the fifth seal, remember I referred to this earlier, seals 1, 2, 3, 4 are white, red, black, gray horses that bring the message. It starts off pretty good. Things are white. They're on a white horse. Goes down to a red horse where things get bloody. Goes to a black horse where things get downright nasty. Then it goes to a pale horse where it's just sickly and almost dead. Speaking of the relationship 
of the governments of this world with the believers, with the saints. Then the next thing is the fifth seal. He opened the fifth seal. I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Revelation 13, 10. In the middle of the text, about the beast. He who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. How did the saints who were being abused by the people around them have patience to live through it? How did they have faith that God would make them victorious in the end, right? Why does the book of Revelation talk about those that overcome? How do they do that? The knowledge that those who lead the saints into captivity have to go into captivity themselves. And those who use the sword against them would be killed by the sword. Now we know that in the end, down there at that end of the chart, they're going to be consumed with fire. But in the interim, God is going to send a sword wars. That's how he deals with this planet. How is it going to end when Jesus shows up? War. A thousand years before they're finally burned in the fire. We have to see that that's the pattern. Revelation 11, 4 through 6. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands standing before the God of the earth. Now this is the two witnesses, but he's told the two witnesses are the two olive trees and the two lampstands. Revelation, or excuse me, Romans 11. Who are the olive branches? What's the olive tree? It's the believers. It's those who are tied into the promises given to Abraham, of which Israel are the natural branches. The church or the Gentiles are the wild branches grafted in. Okay, What is the lampstand or what is the candlestick in Revelation? What did it symbolize even in Israel? It's the, it's the people who hold the truth. It's the source that the oil is in. It holds the oil and the light emanates from it. Right? The two witnesses are the believers. And if anyone wants to harm them, fire proceeds from their mouth and devours their enemies. Literally? No. But what he's saying is, as sure as you call to God, God hears. And God hands out the punitive actions. And if anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this manner. These have power to shut heaven so that no rain falls in the days of their prophecy. And they have power over waters to turn them to blood. This one's a little more cryptic. But as I understand the other prophecies in Revelation, water is turning to blood it's not literal like we see in Exodus. That was very literal, water turned to blood. But that the sea, which represents the mass of humanity, war can come on them. Blood, fire, vapors of smoke. Okay? And to strike the earth with all plagues as often as they desire. God hands it out. God hands it out on the schedule that he thinks is right. But it's at the request of the saints. 
last text. Romans 12, 18 to 21. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. And we probably should pause right there and think about that, take that in and make sure we've got that before we proceed. The command to us is, to the very extent that you are capable, live peaceably with everyone else. It's not for us to do the handing out. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves. If you stop right there, how, how hard is that to understand? Don't avenge yourselves. But rather, the other side of that is, give place to wrath. Give place. Make room. Step back. Allow it to happen. You don't do it. You let God do it. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. So the question is, do we believe him when he says he will do it? Some of us are bothered by this. We think, well, we're supposed to be, you know, wise as serpents, harmless as doves, all these things. Pacifistic in nature. Yes, we are. But that doesn't mean that it undoes what we read, the very first text that we read, which was, I will bless them that bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. The question came in over the internet this morning. Was there a curse on Judas? Yes, because he cursed Jesus. That's a pretty simple one to answer. That's why Jesus said it was better than a millstone, right? With tight around his neck. Better that he was not born. Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, powerful part of grammar, cause and effect. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. If you do what is right, God will hear, God will take over. In his time, in his way, whatever he means by coals of fire. But what we can't deny is that he does it. And so, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. The order is still to us, be good. Understand that God has the control of the rest of it. Took you a few minutes over. You've been very good. I know that this was kind of a hot topic, right? So, I thought that we would just end with, with a with a prize. So, let's close with a song. service today was song number 113, Make Me a Blessing. 113. <laughs> Let's dance.
Our loving Heavenly Father, we are truly thankful for your words that you have given us. We're thankful for those who brought those words to us, the teachers that have come before, that instilled these things in us. We pray that we would all take the information that you have given us and build on that information to become a more perfect, understanding believer of yours and in you. We do pray that you will forgive us when we fail you. We ask that you will be with those that could not be or would not be with us this morning, that you would guide and protect and comfort and heal all of your people as fits within your plan, your knowledge, and your mercy. Until the day that you choose to send Jesus back, may that day be soon, and may we be granted a place in your kingdom then. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Thank you.